Hello and welcome to the Distinguished Speaker Series. I am delighted to see so many of you here tonight and you are in for a fun evening of conversation. I'm Julie Morton. I'm the Associate Dean of the Executive MBA Program and there will be three of us speaking this evening. Madhav Rajan, Kunal Kapoor and, and me and all other participants will be muted. However, we would like you to participate by asking questions. To do that, please just type your question into the Q&A box at any time during the talk. If you have issues with your audio, you may wanna shut down programs running in the background or dial in from your phone. Our conversation today will last 60 minutes. Madhav and Kunal will speak and then we'll have ample time for your questions. The session is being recorded and we will make it available to you on our Distinguished Speaker website. On behalf of Chicago Booth, thank you so much for joining us. We know you have a lot of demands on your time, especially at this time in the world, and we really appreciate your interest. With that, over to you, Madaf. Thank you, Julie. Hi, everyone. As uh, Julie said, I'm Madhav Rajan. I'm the uh, Dean of Chicago Booth and the George Schultz Professor of Accounting. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this evening. Uh, it's a thrill to have you here as we welcome Booth alum Kunal Kapoor, CEO of Morningstar, to our Distinguished Speaker Series. The Distinguished Speaker Series is, of course, a long-standing Chicago Booth tradition, and it brings together high-profile business, government, and community leaders to the school to share their insights and experience. We started doing the DSS events virtually last April when the pandemic first came, uh, and we had great chats with people like Kurt Del Bene from Microsoft, uh, Jenny Scanlon of UL, Tom Ricketts of the Cubs, learning a great deal about how these executives and their firms were dealing with the onset of COVID-19. Uh, the events were very successful and we continued doing them in the autumn as well. Uh, we had a variety of events. We had uh, Anne Mukherjee from Perno Ricard, North America. We did some events for Asia with JP Gan. Uh, we had Dave McLennan from uh, Cargill, uh, Dr. Griffin Myers of Oak Street Health and so on. Close 2020 with a, with a terrific chat with Linnea Roberts and uh, Sally Krawcheck. And then we welcomed 2021 with a chat with Melody Hobson from uh, Aerial Investments. And then Bill McComb, formerly of Fifth and Pacific. With that, I'm thrilled to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Kunal Kapoor is a CFA. He's a Chief Executive Officer of Morningstar. Uh, before he took his current role in 2017, he served as president, responsible for product development and innovation, sales and marketing and driving strategic prioritization across the firm. So Kunal joined Morningstar in 97 and has had a variety of roles, including leadership positions in research and innovation, uh, director of mutual fund research, and he was part of the team that launched Morningstar Investment Services. He's been director of business strategy for international operations, and later president and chief investment officer of Morningstar Investment Services. He's also led Morningstar.com and the firm's data business as well as its global product and client solutions group. Thank you so much for being with us today, Kunal. Thanks for having me, Madhav. I appreciate it. So uh, we've had the pleasure of having you speak uh, at the school and to our students and alumni on a variety of occasions, uh, management conference, economic outlook, and recently at an event for the Rastandi Center for Social Sector Innovation. Uh, this is the first time though we've spoken to you since the onset of COVID. So maybe we thought we'd begin by just asking you, what has it been like uh, leading Morningstar through COVID? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as it has been for everyone, it would be fair to say it's been quite an experience. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's one of those situations one could never have planned for. But on the other hand, it's also one of those situations where everything that you thought you were planning for in a once in a lifetime situation you got to see it live, whether it worked or not. And, and so I have to say it's um, been really obviously a big challenge. It's, 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 it's been a lot of pivoting, a lot of adjusting, but the one thing that I will say is that it's also been a fantastic opportunity just for our firm to you know, commit to each other, to our purpose. And uh, you know we've come together really nicely. And, and, and so if you had told me in December, 2019, Madhav, here's a script for 2020, and this is how Morningstar is gonna come out at the end of it, I would have said, uh, I think you're probably um, sitting in fantasy land, um, but 
you know, it's it's been remarkable how everyone's kind of come together and rallied, and um, it, it it turned out that um, you know it was a good test of our purpose and our mission and our culture. And I'm really proud of our team, and um, I couldn't be prouder of the way that the script has actually gone. In your words, uh, just sort of going back over the last say 12 to 15 months, what's been the biggest challenge that you've had to face because of COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like I think for a lot of firms, if you go back to March and April, they would tell you that the biggest challenge was sort of pivoting to a virtual environment and making sure that everybody was ready for that. And certainly, there were some challenges associated with with, with that for us as well. But mostly, we were prepared, and I, I think um, you know we pivoted very quickly and rather smoothly. The biggest challenge that I'll kind of throw out um, is keeping our culture intact, right? I, I think a lot of firms talk about their culture and the importance of their culture. And this is a firm that we've built on a very unique culture. And the fact that everyone is, um, you know, I'm in the office here today and there's maybe 30, 40 people uh, in the office and, and normally there's about 2,000 people here, uh, that it becomes more challenging to manage a culture the longer something like this uh, drags on. And so that's the thing I think about a lot. And, and that's the challenge that we all have. Um, I think also just as a leader, the challenge is um, how you adjust your style. I, I, I would say that by nature, I'm not a micromanager. I you know, really sort of believe in empowering people and, and, and the folks who um, you know, make up Morningstar. But I would say the pandemic in different stages has required different stages of sort of micromanagement for leaders as well. And you know, I've, I've had to throw myself into details of things that um, you know, maybe normally I would not have. And so I think just being versatile as a leader and kind of adjusting to the situation has been pretty important as well. So you spoke about culture and of course, Morningstar is known for having a very flat collaborative culture. Nobody has offices, including you. Uh, what has that meant in this remote environment, particularly as people are, as you mentioned, are sort of, sort of coming back and longer term, uh, where do you see this changing? Is remote work the future, or what do you see uh, coming back, let's say, six to eight months from now? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, Mahal. I'm sure you have some views on it uh, as well. I mean, you know, you're right. We have an egalitarian culture. We're very proud of the fact that everyone is an equal here. But I've learned in the remote world, you're even more equal. And so sometimes when I say that, like people say, well, what does that mean? Well, here's a simple example. Today, you and I are sitting here talking to each other and we're each in our own Zoom tile. And now picture some of the other meetings you've been in, right, Mahu? There's maybe eight to 10 of you and you're all in your Zoom tiles. And everyone has one tile and everyone is communicating in that fashion and brings some real evenness to everybody. And then think back now to pre-COVID, for example. I would imagine you did many of these types of calls and Perhaps there were four people sitting in a conference room in one Zoom tile, and then two people who were offsite in their own individual Zoom tiles, and probably the balance of power was with the four people sitting in that one conference room in that one tile, as opposed to what you have now, which is everyone spread out in their own tiles. So actually, I think like the remote environment even forces even more egalitarianism just by nature of the fact that we're all in it together you know, very equally. And it's interesting that as people have started to come back to the office, I've insisted that if we're doing meetings where um, part of the team is not in the office, which is now pretty much par for the course, everyone still bring their laptop to the room and have a single tile. Because I do feel like that changes the nature of um, the equation. And so going forward, you know, what does all of this mean? And um, you know, how are we gonna kind of manage it? There's so many schools of thought. Right, like, it, do you go all remote? Do you say you're all back in the office? And I, 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 what I would say is that ultimately it has to work for your culture. I started off by saying that um, so much of who we are is about our people, the way we connect to a purpose and mission. And I do believe a lot of that comes through the office. Uh, you know, we, we hired last year about a thousand people across Morningstar and many of them have never set foot around the world in our offices. I can't tell you with confidence that those people are having the same cultural experience that someone who's kind of walked through the office at some point have. And so we need to kind of find the right balance of giving people the flexibility that I think 
we've all come to appreciate and that we think actually makes people more productive um, with the reality that the office does have a role, if it's an, even if it's an evolved role. So I've, I've said we'll be an office first culture, which means the office will be the center of a lot of collaborative activities. There'll be good reasons to be in the office, but also that builds in flexibility so that if it's um, Monday morning in Chicago and we've just had six inches of sh snow, you don't have to trudge onto Metra and you know try to trudge downtown in the way that you might have. I was thinking about that this Monday because we did get snow and I was like, oh my God, why did I do that before? So there's some obvious things like that that I think you can kind of work through. Uh, you talked about the different offices. So maybe you could just say a little bit about how global a firm Morningstar is and how you've had to deal with this sort of differentially in different countries. Yeah, and I, I think it's actually super humbling um, when, I, when I look at it from that perspective. Uh, you know, we're about 8,000 people globally and about 1,000 of those people are in China. And so they started to feel it um, obviously in January, 2019, February, 2019, I'm uh, sorry, 2020. And um, I, you know, we supported them, did all we could, but I don't think looking back, most companies, even where we had operations in China, realized the extent through which this could spread. So good thing was we started to learn from them as they started to go remote in, in terms of how we'd cope and, and, and when the rest of the firm needed to go remote, we took lessons and, 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 and kind of applied them. But I, I think we were, in retrospect, like everybody else, um, fooled into thinking it was maybe a regional issue only. And um, I wish we had both been more empathetic and supportive of our colleagues in that part of the world earlier. And that was kind of a mistake on my part in terms of not recognizing that. But I think once we obviously had to deal with it on, on a global scale, we've done a better job. And you know, it, it, it's, it's been different everywhere. Um, and, 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 and the issues are, are, are different um, in every location. I would say, for example, uh, you know, you look at a country like Japan, where the challenge is that they are not a remote culture and they like the face-to-face -face interactions. And so, you know, with, with that office, a lot of it has been helping our teams think about how do you actually engage with clients and do your work in this type of environment because it doesn't feel natural to them. Um, if you start moving uh, west a little bit from there, you know, in India, we, we have um, 1,500 odd people and, you know, a, a, as you are aware, Martha, like a, a lot of people live in smaller flats or apartments and they don't have the kind of space that you might have in a Western country. They don't have great access to Wi-Fi. And so we did things like, um, you know, get everyone Wi-Fi dongles in, in a couple of days and, and, and start paying for people's Wi-Fi and getting them like desks and stuff like that, which you don't have to do elsewhere, but concurrently start doing in, in a location, um, you know, like that. You start to move over into other parts of the world in Europe, where again, you know, depending on the country you're in, um, different types of comfort with being in a remote environment. And, and we just had, had to support people uh, very differently. I think in the U.S. and Canada, the move to remote was probably uh, smoothest because people have been using some of the technology and it was a little bit easier uh, from that perspective. Um, but even there, you know, teaching people how to, you know, get engaged and, 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 and not let things slip is, is, is super important. Uh, we've learned a lot of habits, but I, I think like one of the things I learned personally was um, when you're in a remote environment, being a little bit more regimented about your schedule is actually probably more important than um, not because um, otherwise you can sort of start letting things slip quite easily. So it, it, it's been um, different everywhere, but we've kind of tried to be empathetic and we've just used the mindset that if people need stuff, we should just get it to them. And, and not spend too much time arguing about, you know, whether someone needs a, needs a laptop or a chair or whatever. If someone needs it, makes their work environment better, let's just get it to them. So we have a sort of a follow-on question that came from one of the audience members uh, about the recovery from the pandemic. Uh, the question is, as we recover from the pandemic through vaccines, will there be a quote, roaring 20s effect in the market? Um, and what extent has anticipation of this already been baked into the current market? Yeah. Well, let me start by saying that if I do any macro forecast, Madhav, you probably want to go short anything that I share. So I'll just put that disclaimer out there. I'm a horrible macro technician, and um, everything I quote here is uh, likely taken with a grain of salt. But I do like to take a look at things from a bottom-up perspective, which is the way I'll try to address it. So I think there's no doubt that there's a ton of monetary stimulus out there 
and that there's a commitment in different parts of the world to continue that stimulus uh, as long as the pandemic um, is around. And you're seeing here in the US, the Biden administration is continuing to be aggressive. You're seeing the Trudeau government up in Canada doing the same. You're seeing um, European governments starting to think about another round given that they might have a double dip there. So I, I think there's no doubt we're all ex exhausted of sort of being shut up indoors and we want to get out. And I think there will be some activity. Um, anyone, my guess is as good as anyone's, I would say, in terms of what the pace at which it happens. I, ultimately, it comes down to confidence that there's some level of herd immunity and that we have a common way of engaging with each other. And it seems logical that that will be some point in the second half of this year. And I, I can't say exactly when that will be, but it seems that that will be logical. Now, you also mentioned that have stock markets priced this in already? And certainly the rising sort of equity premium around the world certainly indicates that they may have done that in some parts of the world. All I would caution against Madhav is when we talk about stock markets, we're usually talking about particular indexes and you know, in, in many cases, those are market cap weighted indexes that give a very sort of um, disjointed view of what's actually happening. And so, for instance, in the U.S., five companies last year accounted for a majority of the rise in some of the popular indexes, like the Morningstar U.S. Market Index. And so um, I, I, I would be a little bit cautious about extrapolating too much from there. But I also think that it's interesting when I look from a bottom-up perspective today at the ratings our analysts here at Morningstar do on individual stocks. Um, right before this meeting, I took a look to see where things stood today. And we have less than 30 stocks rated five stars today. So less than 30 stocks that we think are um, materially undervalued relative to what we think their fair value is. And you contrast that, Mazov, with um, March, April, when our analysts you know, had between 500 to 1,000 stocks uh, in that range. So sometimes you know, it's, it's human nature to get excited after things go up, and, and, and that seems to be happening a little bit here. Um, but by the same token, there are some real beaten up sectors that um, have not participated in the rally, and um, it'll be interesting to see how things um, shake out. It certainly feels a little bit like we're seeing the re-surgence of a bifurcated market where you have uh, something similar to what you had with the tech media telecom bubble where there was a part of the market that took off and then a part of the market that did not um, the only thing i would say is that even in technology um, where a lot of people are saying stuff is overvalued one can argue that maybe there's segments of technology that's overvalued but it's hard to paint a broad brush i think Thank you. That, that's fascinating. Um, so you, you, of course, went to Booth. Uh, Joe Mansueto, who founded Morningstar, went to Booth. And I know you're very connected to the school. Uh, Steve Kaplan serves on your board, for example. Yeah. Um, so what seems to make Morningstar and Booth such a good pairing is question one. And then the audience question is sort of what were your favorite moments while you were at school? Yeah, yeah. Well, let me just start by saying for Steve's benefit that my biggest mistake was not taking his class. Steve is still mad at me that I saved up all my points for Dick Taylor and went into Dick Taylor's class instead of Steve's class. So he holds that against me to this day. Um, but I, th I think we've gotten past it uh, quite a bit now. So um, look, I, I, I think, you know, a booth education is just a, it's a, it's a terrific education. Um, it's a very versatile education, and I, I think like it's uh, evidence-based education because of the focus on data, no matter the discipline that you are uh, pursuing, right? So I remember some of my favorite classes at Booth were in the marketing area, and one of the reasons I loved it, even back when I was there, was that it was so data-driven. And today you look at the marketing field and the discipline around marketing, it's all about data. And I think back to stuff I learned at Booth you know, 15 odd years ago, and we were already talking about the stuff that people were starting to think about implementing back then. Now it's all the rage, and we've kind of done that uh, all the way back there. So I, I think that's a big part of it. The community of faculty and, and students is a huge part of it, right? There's a lot of pride. And, 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 and for us at Morningstar, um, ultimately, it's also just about, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about people just being critical thinkers and not just being smart. Um, you can get a lot of people who are textbook smart and who um, will do the right thing, 
but I, I think we have a culture where we love people who are critical thinkers, um, can say things openly. Uh, actually, yesterday I sent out a note to the company as I do every couple of weeks and someone wrote back to me and said, you know, I don't think you wrote this part particularly well. And I love that the person did that because they were comfortable in doing that. And, and I don't think this person went to Booth, but I think that's the kind of culture that Booth has as well. And one of the reasons that, um, you know, I, I think it's a superior place to be at. So we spoke uh, when I read your bio, right? You, you've done a lot of work in innovation at Morningstar, right? And the company has continued to try to innovate both internally and by uh, doing acquisitions, right? You, you bought Sustainalytics, which is provides ESG, which is uh, another topic we'll chat about. Yeah. Uh, pitch book, you stayed out of private capital markets. So how do you evaluate these sorts of external opportunities? And in particular, given your unique culture, how do you think about bringing them in and sort of meshing them within Morningstar? Yeah, I mean, so both the examples you cite, um, PitchBook and Sustainalytics have some things in common, which is that Morningstar was an investor in both firms for a steady period. And, you know, we moved to acquire the firms when the founders of the firms were ready to sell and become part of Morningstar versus Morningstar forcing their hand. And I, and I say that because that's a very different approach than a lot of firms. And, and I say that because I like to run this business with a long-term perspective where people can think and act like owners. And PitchBook is an example now where it's year five of PitchBook being part uh, of Morningstar. And you know I'm really proud not only of the fact that the team has done a great job and the business has been solid, but everyone who came with the business, the leadership team, including John Gabbard, who founded it, uh, is still there and running PitchBook. And so um, when you talk about a unique culture, you have to make sure that the people who are coming into the firm also feel like they can contribute to the culture and it aligns with them. And I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I will say that, you know, from an acquisition perspective, those are the kinds of acquisitions I love. Uh, we do participate from time to time in auctions, but that's a model that's much harder for us because it's it's harder to evaluate the cultural fit. It's harder to think about um, how we're gonna work with those people. We've, we've moved and we've done some good things through auctions, but I so much prefer the path of getting to know a firm, um, building a common vision, and then you know empowering the people who have built that business to be successful for a long time versus feeling like they're just making an exit. Um, and so we tend to self-select and, and, and find those kind of people. And uh, yeah, if you're an entrepreneur looking for a long-term home, I'm sure many of you, Booth, are, you know, give us a call if you're ever interested. So I'm sure Madhav did not want that ad, but hey. No, no, no go for it. <laughs> uh, so we have a question, a related question from the audience, which is, um, you mentioned Taylor, so it's kind of related. How do you inculcate behavioral finance into an investment product? How do you think about that? Well, it is a very timely topic because of what has been going on in the markets in the past 10 days with the surge in you know stocks such as GameStop and, and and kind of what's going on there the animal spirits so to speak have been woken up right and everyone wants to figure out like ex exactly how all of this is going to um, play out and end and I think fundamentally what you have is you know Taylor would say that uh, people are essentially being greedy and so you know they're trying to basically pile into a trade that might already have lived its course. And so we, we, we tend to talk to people a lot about, um, you know, being more pragmatic and behaviorally oriented in the way that they approach things. So simple, simple things that you can do, right? Be, uh, you, could, you could be more of an automatic investor. So uh, Madhav, as, as you know, like uh, at least here in the US, if you have a 401k plan, the people who are most successful are not necessarily the people who pick the best investments. They're the people who get started early and they're the people who do it in a programmatic way. And one of, one of the hurdles always is with behavioral, or behavioral finance will tell you that one of the hurdles is that people hate contributing more of their paycheck um, when you know they're adding to their 401k. And so one way you could do that, and, and, and one, one, one thing we've done that others do as well, is if you get a raise, more of your paycheck automatically starts to go into your 401k, so you don't sort of feel like you, 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 you're you in any way sort of, um, you know, missing out. And, and the same thing appears to individual equities, really starting to think about, you know, sometimes when you get pulled into something, are there tools that can kind of slow down your 
um, desire to just kind of rush into something because your neighbor thinks it's a good idea or you have envy around what your neighbor is doing because those are sort of the kinds of problems that um, you know we can get into and, and and later on I know you want to talk about ESG but we've we've been in the process of building a, what we call an ESG preferences tool and the whole thing around ESG preferences is this notion of what are the trade-offs you make from a behavioral perspective if you have certain ESG biases and how does that play through a portfolio so I think it's a lot about making people aware of their biases and helping them um, you know bring them under control and often that means automating things or slowing them down a little bit um, because we certainly live in a world where people feel the need to kind of just snap snap and do things and it doesn't work for most individuals um, and, 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 and so we've tried to build that into a lot of our tools. Um, so Sustainalytics, again, was sort of your uh, entree to ESG, may, or maybe, maybe that's not true, you can correct me, but basically that was a big step forward. And after that, you've announced you're going to incorporate ESG into everything that you're doing. What do you think of ESG? Is that just like the, a fad du jour? Is that, does it have staying power? What is your broad view about ESG? Yeah, I, do, do you want the booth view here or do you want the... Kunal view. I'll go with the Kunal view. <laughs> right. So I mean, I mean, I mean, let, let, let me talk about it a little bit from both angles. So I, I think, like, right, if 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 you believe in efficient markets and um, you think about how stocks and individual companies are valued, you could make the argument that generally, if an, if a company has a particular ESG, um, you know, premia, it's going to be built into its stock price and discounted uh, appropriately already. And I think there's some merit to that argument and. One of the things I'd like for us to do is to actually identify the factors that can make a difference and we're spending time you know, doing that research. I think it'll be meaningful. Um, there's also just a reality, Martha, that there's a non-investment angle here that I think if you look at individual companies, what you're finding is many are embracing ESG not just because it makes sense to do it because they're also finding that they're better run when they embrace ESG principles. And people automatically, when you hear ESG, people start with the notion that it's all about environmental or social. But we've been, as a society and as investors, focused on governance for a long time. So that's not a new concept and it does add value. So starting just with governance is, I think, meaningful. And I think the E and the S are evolving uh, quite meaningfully as well. You know, one thing I will say that is maybe a little bit different than what the, I think, common discussion around ESG is, is it, it's, it's it, my view is it's not worth waiting around and trying to convince people whether it's good or not. I think that is it's it's moving ahead whether people believe in it or not. Like it is a fa these factors are here to stay, and just as we think of risk today, we're going to think of ESG as being you know core to a portfolio. And you know, like Madhav, I imagine if you asked your daughter how she wants to invest, she's going to tell you she's paying more attention to those factors than you and I probably were when we started out and started as investors. And I think that's important for one really critical reason, which is that many people who are professionally involved in finance think that everyone around them is as into finance as they are. And the evidence suggests that most people are not, right? People have other things to do in life, and most of my friends really don't think my job is as interesting as I think it is. Um, but the reason for that is because they have other interests. Now, the problem, Madhav, is that when, when, when that happens, you have a lot of people who just disengage with the markets. And that's an issue because, especially in Western economies where more and more people need to take care of their savings, if you disengage and don't think about your savings, you probably are not saving enough. And so I actually think ESG is a fantastic way through which investing will be personalized, through which it will be made more engaging. And so while a lot of people, including me, are fascinated by the debate of like which factors are going to add alpha and et cetera, the reality is most people don't care about that. And what resonates to them is that they can build a portfolio for the first time that actually makes sense to them and that they care about. And I say that if the effect of that is more people start to save and do it early and get engaged with investments, I think that's actually a pretty fantastic outcome and one that we should not take lightly given some of the bifurcations that have you know, taken place in our society and the fact that so many people are not putting away what they need to um, to realize their retirement ambitions, for example. Um, so 
we have some questions from the audience, so I'm going to sort of combine a couple of them. You've been at Morningstar a long time, as we've spoken about. You've been CEO for more than four years now. What has stayed the same and what has changed over the years at Morningstar, at, you know, in your view? Yeah, I mean, so much has changed. We're like a different company every year. And I feel like I have a different job every year. I, I was talking right before this, I was talking to our chief technology officer. And he said to me that, you know, that this is a review season at Morningstar. And, 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 and so we're all kind of doing a little bit of uh, soul searching and looking back at things. And he said, you know, I was just jotting down all the things I'm, I'm, I'm focused on right now. And it's nothing like I was doing two years ago. And so sometimes when people have the itch and, and, and they think about like, well, why would one person be at one firm for so long? I, I always challenge that because it comes down to whether that firm is morphing and changing and whether as a result, you two are morphing and changing. And I think in close to 25 years here, I feel like I've had 25 jobs, I've worked at 25 firms. And um, if I think about our firm in five years from, you know, if I think of our firm five years from today, I don't think it's gonna look like the firm it is today because it'll be different and it'll grow in different ways. And so um, I think that's what's critical is, 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 is thinking about how um, firms can evolve and grow and, and, and change is like something that everyone loves to talk about. It's, it's, it's a passion that most people have, like the, the concept of change. And I like to say change is great for most people unless it impacts them. And uh, you know, one thing that I, I have just come to appreciate is that um, the way to grow is actually to embrace it and kind of get beyond your own misgivings. And so, you know, I walked in the morning store when it was a $30 million firm with about 250-ish employees. And, uh, you know, we're a little bit larger today. And um, along the way, I've, I feel like I've had a great experience. And, and, and when I think about like how we get to be a five and $10 billion firm, it's gonna be because we're different and I'm gonna go grow differently. I'm gonna have to lead differently. Um, the job I had to do four years ago is different than the job I have to do t today. In fact, I would argue the job I had to do leading through COVID is gonna be very different from the job I have to do leading post COVID. Um, and, 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 and so that, that's what makes it fun. And, and, and um, I know people always have itches and everyone goes through ups and downs in their careers. But um, I, I, I think often the need to leave is maybe overstated. So uh, you've been there a long time, so you're probably managing many people that who you started working alongside with, or maybe even who managed you. What has that been that? And question is, what advice would you give to alumni who are in a similar position? Yeah, it, it was probably more awkward earlier in my career than um, it is uh, now. And I, I, I think, look, ultimately, people want to do the right thing and they want to be part of winning teams. And to the extent there's awkwardness, I've always tried to be open about it and be clear about it. And, you know, I find that when I focus on leading and, and, and doing the work at hand rather than on the potential awkwardness, you overcome it pretty fast. And, and the key is to have shared goals, shared mission. And um, I think you need to perform at the level that your job demands and people um, you know, usually are pretty confident as a result. So I, I certainly had that situation and um, I, I can't say that um, it's not awkward, but I will also just say that it's eminently manageable if you put your head down and, and, and do the right things and, and, and lead in a way that's authentic to you. I, I, I think, by the way, the concept of just being authentic is really, really important and um, gets overlooked in general. Uh, when I hear a lot of CEOs, you know, talk, and I'm I'm stealing stuff from people all the time in terms of their leadership styles. The one thing I think people don't spend a lot of time on is communication style. And you know, I've really insisted here that any communications coming from me need to be in my voice, in my style. And relative to other folks who are CEOs who I know, I spend a lot of time on ensuring that communications that come with my name on them actually represent me and my voice and not a bunch of jargon and mumbo jumbo that people don't represent. And um, I think being authentic in that way resonates with people, including those who maybe, you know, you have to manage who previously were, were your managers because they, they know it's still you and that you're not trying to suddenly be something you're not. So this is maybe a sort of a prequel to that point. This is an audience question that's saying in hindsight, do you see 
any pivotal decisions that you made, uh, great mentors that you had or skills that you know allowed you to advance to the CEO role? Yeah, I mean, there's a few things I would say. One is, um, I, I I did I did things probably that others didn't want to do, and I talk a lot about this in in, in general with uh, people when they ask me this question. You know, by nature, I'm a bit of a contrarian, and I I, I do love the unloved. Uh, I I don't know why, but it's sort of uh, my strategy. I'm a value investor too, so uh, yeah, I've been taking a good bath on that front, but. Um, uh, I, I, I generally like that aspect of things. And I, I would say that in my career, I took on roles in leadership that probably were leadership roles that others did not desire. And I learned early on that running sort of the shiny business was not always the most fun thing. And I, I remember this because I had two very stark experiences early on as a leader. One where I was probably given the smallest, least interesting leadership job at Morningstar at that time because it was a business that we were not doing well in. And I was handed that business right in the middle of the financial crisis. And under my leadership, the business actually went down from a financial perspective during that time. But it was an amazing leadership um, opportunity, hands-on. And even though the financial results did not reflect it at the time, we were able to completely pivot the business um, partly because people didn't care and we, we were able to take risks and do things. And, and, and it's kind of stayed with us for a long time and is now one of our more successful businesses. And conversely, um, early in my career, I was also given one of our shiny businesses to run. And it was probably one of my least favorite experiences because the message was don't screw it up. And everyone was watching everything you were doing. And, and so that was, um, th 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 that, that's an important thing. I would also say that I always, um, was unafraid of hiring people with more experience and expertise in areas that I had uh, limited experience and expertise. And so I always hired above my level and above budget. And um, I took some risks um, you know, in that context that I think um, were pretty important um, from a leadership perspective. So, so those are a few things, Madhav, that I would say that you know are important. Um, or at least were different uh, from the perspective of my own um, journey. Maybe let me just uh, ask you about, uh, did you have any mentors uh, while you were going up? Who are people you sort of look up to? Maybe in Morningstar or maybe people outside? Yeah, I mean, well, there's this guy, Joe Mansueto, who founded our firm <laughs> and uh, is somewhat affiliated with the University of Chicago. Um, you know, I mean, Joe is my primary mentor. And to this day, um, you know, so much of uh, who I am as a leader uh, certainly comes, you know, from him and uh, his style, his authenticity, uh, his long-term nature, his ability to sort of be calm even when things are uh, pretty rough. I think that's actually a really important part of leadership is to not panic when situations are bad. And um, I, I think it gives teams a lot of confidence when the leader is, is kind of calm, especially in a year like last year. So certainly from him, you know, I've, I've, I've learned a lot of good lessons. Um, you know, I, I also just would say that uh, this may, you maybe don't hear this always, but you know, I, I, I'm an immigrant to the US. And when I first came uh, to this country uh, as a student, I often, you know, I was in dorms and we, we would stay in the dorms even during the holidays because we weren't flying back home or whatever when everybody went home and and, and through that we're sort of born really deep relationships um, with professors and faculty members and some of my mentors to this day are academics and um, the thing that i always learned from them and still reach out to them for is the ability to challenge appropriately and to um, not take being challenged personally and, and so the process of debate um, and, and, and then how in an academic setting that's so critical and important is something that I have really kind of learned from many of the faculty who I say sort of are on my, um, you know, personal board. And, and, and so those are, are people. And then there's, you know, obviously family members who are, um, you know, mentors as, as well. My um, mom and dad obviously are strong 
mentors in the sense that they've always sort of pushed me in a certain direction. My wife is a great mentor because she's the opposite of me. And uh, uh, whenever I, I, I zig, she zags. And uh, sometimes like when I have a hard, gnarly business problem, I sit down and talk to her and she gives me an answer that I don't expect. And uh, it's incredible to have like a person who can kind of do that for you because otherwise um, you tend to keep zig zigging along in your own merry way. Thank you. Uh, that, was, that was wonderful. Uh, let me turn it over to Julie now for uh, some more audience questions. Julie? Sure. Thanks. Thanks. I think your comment about everybody having their own tile at the at the beginning, and also when the when you told the story about the person who gave you feedback that you didn't write particularly well in this particular part of what you were doing, has prompted a few more questions about your own sort of personal style. Um, somebody's written in and said, "Was there a time in your career where you felt stuck?" in terms of your own learning and growth and your own increases in responsibility? And how did you handle that? Yeah, so I mean, candidly, since uh, we're among friends, um, one of the things I recall when I was at Booth is that on my first day there during orientation, one of the things that was said is if at the end of your Booth education, you don't switch firms, you're a failure. This was an actual quote. And when it came time to graduate, from Booth, um, I started to have uh, this thought about that quote. And I was like, oh my god, uh, am I not going to switch firms here because uh, I'm about to graduate? And, and, and so um, I, I, I think it was a healthy kind of internal process. And uh, in all candidness, I actually just did put my resume out there just to see what type of reaction uh, it would elicit and what kind of conversation um, I, I might have just because I, I, I wanted to experience something and, 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 and sort of uh, do that. And um, I, I think like it was interesting from my perspective because I, I did end up getting some offers that I never took, thankfully, because um, what it taught me is that the things that I was, you know, feeling restless about, I actually had in my power to go and discuss. And instead of taking those offers, I actually went to my manager at that time and said, hey, look, I don't want to leave, but I have suddenly got all these other skill sets that I feel like I'm not using. Can you help me out and think about something else I might do? And within, I think, a week or two, just prior to my graduating booth, he had changed my job and given me the opportunity as a result of that conversation. And I learned through that that the power of just um, being transparent about my intentions is super helpful from a career perspective. Um, and in general, I would just say that maybe my patience threshold is higher than other people's. And I, I don't hold, I don't think that's good or bad in all candidness, but I have the ability to be patient and work through situations where there's friction. And, and I, I think like, um, that isn't for everyone, but certainly in my case, you know, that's been important. And I, th I think sometimes it takes time to work through things um, versus sort of being able to snap your finger and kind of get to where you need to. Uh, the other thing I just love about that story is just being able to articulate what it is you bring to the table and how that can have an impact and giving the person that you're working for an opportunity to make some changes. So that's, that's a great, yeah. that's a, it's a great story. It's a great lesson for some of our students. There have been a couple of questions that have come in that are really um, less about you as a leader and more about the business itself. Um, so I'd love to switch gears for a minute and talk yeah. about that. Can you talk a little bit about how you see technology innovation impacting Morgan, Morningstar and your industry as a whole? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we've always sort of thought of uh, research, design, and technology as our three core skills. And I, I think one of the things when you're uh, in a financial services firm, uh, sometimes people assume that to be innovative, you need to invent technology. And I often say to folks internally, you don't need to invent technology to be innovative. You need to leverage technology to be innovative. And that's how I think about it. And in particular, um, I'm obsessed with this notion of friction. 
and taking and removing friction away from the experiences that we bring to clients. Because I think like that is one of the most powerful things that technology can do. It can reduce the steps that it takes to complete a task. So a simple thing. Um, at the start, Madhav asked me a question. Um, do you think the market is over or undervalued today? And one of the ways I tried to answer the question was to talk about um, the number of five-star stocks we have in our coverage. Now, a simple way I might come back to our team and say is, okay, we know that X percent of the people who go to look at our stock coverage are generally not looking for a particular stock. They're looking for ideas. So how do you take away the friction where we know the question they're going to ask, but we're waiting for them to ask it and then to give them the answer? And so how do you get to a world today where we anticipate based on what we know of you, why you're coming in, and we start surfacing stuff to you that are answers so that you don't have to search? And we create these dashboards and things like that. And that's leveraging technology in a way that is radically different. You know, at the start of the pandemic, uh, we, we introduced this thing for financial advisors. So if you're a financial advisor, one of the challenges always is you have reams of paperwork that clients will send you, right? Like, and you got to enter these portfolios and put them in complex accounting systems and all that. Pandemic made that super hard, right? Simple thing, take, have a client take a picture of that statement or all those statements, send them in, and we process them now on the back end and they automatically appear for the advisor in our tool, uh, form fitted, ready to use. Um, that's just technology, like, and it's friction being taken away. And 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 so when when you look at a lot of like, there, there's a lot of talk like fintechs are disrupting banking and whatnot, and they are in payments. But fundamentally, what they're doing is they're taking away friction and some of the costs associated with that friction. And uh, that's a beautiful thing about technology and financial services. If it can make things faster and cheaper then it's a good thing. And the final thing that's really important is like, can they make the outcomes better? Because the outcomes matter as well. And um, you can have the slickest technology, but um, if you're getting people into a situation where they can't realize their goals, that's a problem as well. Switching gears, the past year has been one where um, issues around diversity and inclusion have really been brought to the forefront. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about what you've done at Morningstar that's been in response to some of the events of the past year, um, what you've continued to do, perhaps discontinued doing? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, th I think like we are a very progressive firm in terms of our values, in terms of the way we treat people, in terms of um, how we think about things, the way we run our interview processes, um, the way we look for candidates, and yet our data isn't as good as we feel. And so there's a gap there, right? So th th this is fundamentally the thing where um, you can feel one way, but the data tells a story that reveals otherwise. And since you know I'm sitting here in Chicago, I, I can just say that our employee base in Chicago does not look like the demographics that you see across Chicago. So we got to change that. And, I, and, and like other firms, you know, we, we are doing a combination of things, including participating in some broader initiatives um, with other firms across the city to support the way people um, from certain communities have access um, to professional training. But there's also just a process within Morningstar that matters in terms of how we hire, the pools that we hire from, um, the places that we show up uh, to interview uh, from, uh, you know, the reality is that a University of Chicago interview, it's always very polished when you're talking to somebody. Uh, if you go to the City Colleges of Chicago, you get a different feel. And so uh, how do you kind of bridge that gap and make sure that you're actually, um, you know, able to source candidates that uh, are capable from both places and that together kind of probably can be a little bit more powerful. So we're working through those things. The thing that I keep telling our organization, which I think is very, very important is this is not a short-term fix. And I, I think there's a lot of people who have an expectation that these are short-term fixes. I think they're not. I think they're long-term fixes, and I think they take perseverance. But on the flip side, we in financial services, and I think um, you know Melody would tell you this. I, I, I didn't listen to her uh, conversation with uh, Madhav, but if, if you talk to Melody, and you know I have on several occasions, she'll tell you that 
everything in financial services is measured. Why can't we measure ourselves on this score and hold ourselves accountable? And so we're having the same types of discussions around how you know we can hold ourselves accountable through measurement and data, and that's going to be a big part of how we progress. The Melody conversation was recorded. It was excellent. So you still okay. can see it if you want to. I will, I, I will um, take a look. I think your authenticity with us today has really um, made people feel very comfortable asking you questions that are a little bit more personal in nature. So okay. uh, bear with me as I, as should, I ask. Should I, be, should I be scared? No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Um, so one of the um, questions that's come in has been around your family and the pandemic. You mentioned your wife earlier, um, but what kind of favorite activities have you done with your family during during this this long pandemic period? Yeah, yeah. Well, my kids um, go to lab, but I also hopefully no lab teachers are on. But I, I will just say that they're all about to graduate with degrees from the University of Netflix. So just like every other parent. Um, you know, we, we have um, had lots of Netflix uh, consumption. Um, you know, the, the, the thing I'll just say is uh, we found ways to be outdoors. And, uh, you know, even when the weather is terrible in Chicago, we've just kind of figured it out. And, um, you know, we get out there as a family and uh, I have a couple of teenagers as well as a 10 year old. And um, there's lots of complaining and whatnot. And uh, my 15 year old will uh, proclaim now that he's had enough of the togetherness. But, um, you know, we've, we've just tried to get out and do things. And I, I think the other thing that we really try to do is, like, talk about things. Like, this has been a, a different time um, for children to just sort of process a lot of the stuff going on. And, um, you know, you learn different things from your kids uh, as well. And, uh, you know, my oldest fi at 15 is starting to kind of form political views and kind of grow into that. And it's super interesting to have conversations around the dining table to see how his thought process is forming, or you know that something is starting to run its course when your 13 year old says, hey, what's that stuff about GameStop that's going on? And you're like, okay, this has <laughs> kind of run its course. So, you know, we're, we're finding uh, rituals and activities and mostly it's been around nature and kind of getting out because that's certainly, um, you know, what I love to do. And um, we actually, in the fall, uh, you know, went out um, to some of the national parks and did some hiking and stuff, which was awesome. And you're on the board, aren't you, of the Nature Conservancy? I am indeed, in, 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 for Illinois. Can you talk a little bit about why that organization is important to you and how you chose that organization as one to be involved with? Yeah, I, I should start by saying that I am an underperforming board member. I, 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 I'm trying to get better at it and you know find the cadence, although I always like to complain to them, you can't have a meeting on a Monday afternoon and expect that I'm gonna be there. <laughs> but um, you know, it's an amazing organization. And, and, and one of my passions from when I've been young is to try to find the intersection of economics and environmental policy. I've been interested in this since maybe I was 16, 17 years old. And uh, even in, in, in college as an undergrad, um, I worked with my economics professor to design a course uh, or a series of courses around environmental policy. And I did this sort of special major that they designed um, for me to do, which was a combination of science and um, uh, economics uh, courses. And, and so I have this love for it. And, 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 and the Nature Conservancy I like because they take a very pragmatic approach to trying to solve environmental issues. Um, sometimes some may argue that they're not as uh, aggressive on certain things relative to those that maybe believe things should be faster. But I think they engage with communities. They are heavily focused on urban issues uh, here in the Midwest. You know, issues around pollution of waters um, based on runoff from farms and stuff is a huge issue. So th these are important issues to me. I, I you know, I, I think like um, if nothing else, hopefully people have learned the value of um, being able to get out during this pandemic and. You know, we do have a responsibility, I think, um, to the world around us. And uh, having lived in Chicago now for so long, I've seen how the winters have changed here, right? Like the fact that everyone is overreacting to five inches of snow tells you something because we haven't had five inches of snow in a couple of years. Like we had no snow last year. And, 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 and so change is afoot and there are some practical ways to try to solve for that. And the conservancy is at the heart of doing that. And I'm just, uh, happy to help in any way. 
I have two more questions for you. One is you mentioned Netflix earlier with regard to your kids, um, but how about books or podcasts that you enjoy um, aside from their Netflix activity? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, so I'm, I'm going to start by saying, you know, the Long View, which is the Morning Star podcast, is easily my favorite uh, podcast. And there's one from Pitchbook as well, which I listen to. And if if, if you uh, like those, um, I recommend uh, those. In fact, the one uh, that uh, Morningstar has got this week in the long view is an interview with uh, one of the senior principals at DFA, which is a firm that um, you know David Booth helped uh, found. So there's a strong uh, connection there, and I recommend the conversation. So certainly those things are important. Uh, everyone's been politically, I, I think, attuned to a few things. So I've been listening to the Hacks on Tap podcast. Uh, which is the one David Axelrod is part of. It's a little bit more balanced. It's still probably not entirely balanced, but it's it's kind of been fun to listen to that amidst all of what's um, um, you know, been going on. And, and then I just like to listen to a variety of stuff that uh, I, I try to pick stuff that I don't really know. And you know, I learned this in Harry Davis's class, which was one of my favorite classes uh, at Booth. One of the things that stayed with me is he said, pick up a book that is on a topic that is of no familiarity to you. And so invariably, every week, I will just browse through podcasts and pick a topic that has literally uh, no previous resonance with me just to see what it's about. And I always encourage people to do that. And in terms of books, right, like, um, I actually just finished um, the Obama book, which is long, but fairly thoughtful and interesting in different ways. Um, so I, I did that and I just uh, finished reading Homeland Elegies um, by Ayub Bakhtar, which is it was highly recommended. It's a difficult book to read, but um, uh, interesting and uh, you know thought provoking from many angles uh, as, as well. So those are the two that I've just finished reading. And um, I just picked up this novel, um, uh, what's it called? It just won the National Book Review last year, Chinatown, I'm blanking. But um, if you search National Book Review Chinatown, it's it's kind of pretty funny, at least in the first few pages. It's written like a screenplay. And when do you find time to do all of this reading and podcast listening? Um, I'm a runner, so the podcast listening comes in naturally when I'm doing that. And you know, reading is just a habit. It's it's sort of an intellectual exercise and. Uh, on weekends, I read, and I also actually look at uh, company reports. And I, I still am an analyst at heart, and I like to actually search through and see what companies are up to. And so, if you come to our house, I actually order um, annual reports in 10Ks and 8Ks, and I actually look at them, and I, I learn a lot from others. So, reading is, I, I think, essential to the experience of being, um, you know, thoughtful and curious. Final question: What's on your short list? to focus on in 2021? And you can answer it from a personal perspective or professional or both. What's, what yeah, are your... I, 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 I think it's really important that the habits that I've really come to appreciate are ones I carry forward, right? Like we always talk about, like what are the things you've learned more? Well, a lot of people talk about the value of relationships, the value of time with family, about modifying your schedule in a way that um, you know empowers you differently than pre previously might have been the case. And so I think carrying that forward is important because we all kind of get back into the business of the usual and then you forget about it. And so I'm really trying to think about that. But I'm also thinking about like, when we get back, how can we do so in a way that's exciting and you know with a bang? And I'm really just looking forward to reconnecting with all my colleagues and just making sure our culture here is strong. And I'm looking forward to seeing friends who have not seen for a long time um, and doing those kinds of normal things that, um, have not felt normal for a long time. So that's on my list. Thank you so, so much. This is great. Madaf. Yeah, no, my, my pleasure. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, thank you. So we're out of time, but I just want to say again, as Judy did, thank you uh, for being so open, direct, candid uh, with your comments. I think this was super informative, super interesting to all of us, and we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thank you. Thanks, Madaf. I appreciate it.